inspiration. Yeah. You find any inspiration in this? Uh, we have done, and you have done your noble part. Uh, El Maestro Speaks Podcast. Welcome once again to another episode of Wellmeister Speaks Podcast. And as always, the background you're listening to, background music, is entitled Suyusoy Didagum by Aladin Bagaya. Am I getting the right, are you getting the family name right? Uh, the first name is Aladdin, a musical, I mean, music artist of Cordillera. <sighs> Alright, so, uh, I've been talking about um, a book today that I've read. And I'll be sharing to you the content of this book. But, a little disclaimer here. This book is somewhat controversial, first and foremost, because according to some critics, this book didn't undergo research. So, like, say, for example, the things that is being discussed in this book has not been thoroughly researched. It is based on, like, uh, separate situations and... Uh, like there was no physical I mean, the, the result is not conclusive so to speak in the scientist in a scientist world um, but then this book is pretty popular it's being endorsed by a lot of especially rappers being endorsed by a lot of rappers this book came out in 1998 by the way and a lot of um, a lot of people are like suggesting this. It's a good read, right? And uh, of course, uh, us being a little bit a little bit bored with their life, <laughs> uh, try to find books that we can read, right? As a part of uh, ways to improve ourselves. And this is this is one of the highly suggested books. And one trivia about this book is that this book was banned in a lot of prisons, uh, prison um, facilities in America um, for the reason that it's like a manual in manipulating people, right? Now just imagine notorious or notorious prisoners getting a knowledge on how to manipulate people just imagine the chaos that will ensue if all of them know how to I mean, manipulate people and uh, control people using the techniques that was being uh, shared in this book. Now, the book is entitled The 48 Laws of Power. The author is Robert Greene. Now, I just uh, searched some notes here i have read the book but this was like a long time ago but um there are some statements here that if you are just this disclaimer that you're starting i already started the disclaimer like minutes ago so uh the thing here is the book there are some of the rules that is somewhat manipulative okay um it's like it's teaching us to be deceptive. It's teaching us to manipulate other people. Again, the law, uh, the, the book is entitled 48 Laws of Power. Again, but if we are going to look at it realistically, that's how people behave, right? Um, the only thing that is stopping us from really acting up these behaviors here is our 
um, our moral values, our guiding principles. Right? Now I'm going to share this rules to you and uh, uh, what I want to do here is or my objective here in sharing this one is for my listeners to like use the laws so that we can improve ourselves. That's the main objective of sharing these um the the content of this book though it seems to be of course we have our own beliefs we have our own uh, set of guiding principles now if you listen to me and you I and mean, if you listen to the laws and it seems like it is contradicting your um say for example set of beliefs or guiding principles then of course you can you can choose not to follow the rules, right? So, again, the title of the book is The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. I don't know if this one is in LibriVox. LibriVox is an audiobook I always use. Uh, audiobook app that I use to listen to some books. Um, there are some classics there, like uh, Uncle Tom Sawyer, uh, The Count of the Monte Cristo. Crystal and uh, because one, I did a lot. Okay, <laughs> now uh, I don't know if you can uh, find this one in free in the internet, but here it is. And let us start again. This is 48 Laws of Power. So, this book will no doubt remain a classic for a long time. Again, this came out in 19. 98. Okay, so I will not go with the introduction. Let's just immediately go to the rule number one. The rule number one is never outshine the master. So what's the explanation here? That always make those above you feel comfortably superior. In your desire to please and impress them, do not go too far in displaying your talents, or you might accomplish the opposite. Instead of pleasing them or impressing them, you might instill like fear and insecurity. Make your master appear more brilliant than they are, and you will attain the heights of power. So, practical uh, way is say, for example, if you've done something that has saved your group or your company, always give credit to your master never outshine them right uh, so if somebody appreciates you you can just say oh because of my boss or my boss tells me that i was inspired by my boss and my boss helped me arrive to that idea always never outshine your master so uh, the the rule there is that uh, of course you get the compliment at the same time Always throw a compliment to your master so that he will not be outshined. Outshone. Right? <laughs> Am I getting it right? Okay, so that is rule number one. Never outshine your boss. I mean, here it says their master. And then, of course, you will attain the heights of power. So, how is that? If you always do that one, at least uh, when you, in your journey of climbing up the top they will always be there to like say guide you right because you have never outshone them okay so that's rule number one rule number two never put too much trust in friends learn how to use enemies explanation here is this <clears throat> be wary of friends they will betray you more quickly, for they are easily aroused or aroused to envy. They also become spoiled and tyrannical. But hire a former enemy, and he will be more loyal than a friend because he has more to prove. In fact, you have more to fear from friends than from enemies. If you have no enemies, find a way to make them. <laughs> Friends often conceal things in order to avoid conflict. This can be dangerous. Yeah. 
if there's a lot of concealed things. Sooner or later it will come out and that will ultimately destroy your friendship. So again, it says there that never put too much trust. You can trust your friend, but not too much. Everything in moderation. Another quote that we already know. Keep your friend, uh, keep friends for friendship, but work with the skilled and competent. Even if that's your enemy, if they're skilled and competent, work with them. Whenever you can, bear with the hatchet with an enemy, and make a point of putting him in your service. Um, a good uh, way of uh, doing this in politics, right? So always use your enemies and then use your enemies to define your cause more clearly to the public even framing it as a struggle of good against evil it is better off to know who are your opponents than to not know where your real enemies lie right so um using everyone not putting it or trusting everything to your friends sooner or later if something comes along the way your friend will become your you know your enemy so you can use everyone and the rule here is learn how to use your enemies and never put too much trust in your friend that's number two and number three, conceal your intentions. Yeah, um, most of us, especially in the age of social media, already are so fond of sharing our intentions. Not just with our close circle of friends, but to everyone around the world who is or who are willing to listen to you. So third rule is conceal your intentions. Keep people off balance and in the dark by never revealing the purpose behind your actions. If they have the clue what you're up to, they cannot prepare a defense. Guide them far enough down the wrong path. Envelop them with or in enough smoke and by the time they realize your intention, it will be too late. So, hiding your intentions. Working silently. So the first uh, example here is use decoyed object to desire of desire and red herrings to throw off people of descent. So if at any point in the deception you practice or you practice people have the slightest suspicions of your intentions, all is lost. Do not give them a chance to sense what you're up to. Throw them off the scent by dragging red herrings across the path. Use false sincerity. Send ambiguous signals. Set up misleading the objects of desire, unable to distinguish the genuine or genuine from the false, they cannot pick up your real goal. Hide your intentions not by closing up but by talking endlessly about your desires and goals. Just the false one. So, learning the art of deception to hide your intentions, to throw them off guard. So, uh, this is called uh, the laws of 48 the laws are the 48 laws of power right because uh, it is already given that you are a person holding a power and in order to keep your power this is one of the things that you should do conceal your intentions right another one is Still, we are in rule number three is use a smoke screen to disguise your action. Deception is always the best strategy. But the best deception requires a screen of smoke to distract people att people's attention from your real purpose. The bland exterior, like the unwittable poker face, is often the perfect smoke. Hiding your intention behind a comfortable and familiar. If the lead if you lead the sucker down the familiar path, he won't catch you on when you lead him into a trap. A helpful or honest gesture can divert from a deception. Or patterns will also help a mask a deception. Often the key to deception is being bland and acting with humility. Right? 
So that is number three. Always conceal your intention. Next truth. Always say less than necessary. Less is valuable. When you're trying to impress people with words, the more you say, the more common you appear and the less in control. Even if you are saying something banal, it will seem original if you make it vague, open-ended, and sphinx-like. People or powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. The more you say, the more likely that you are going to say something foolish. And that won't be a that won't apply to me because I talk a lot, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> at least in the case I'm talking in the podcast, but um, um, you'd be surprised if you meet me in person. We, I don't really think so. <laughs> uh, I talk sometimes a lot, yeah, if I know the people well. But here the rule is, okay, the law of power is that you should always say less than necessary make them guessing right silence generally make people uncomfortable yeah they will jump in and nervously feel the silence generally saying less makes you appear more profound and mysterious yeah when we see people who does not talk a lot we find them mysterious we often say oh Siguro malalim ang pag-iisip nito or this guy thinks deeply or has a profound mind because he, he talks less. Things like that. So, be particularly careful with sarcasm. It's real, rarely it, it is or it, rarely is it valuable. So, be particularly careful with sarcasm but with people like me who always uh, find things like to joke upon and that's really difficult anyway I'm not a powerful person anyway we can use this to improve ourselves right be careful in arousing suspicion or insecurity by being silent at times it is easier to blend by playing the gesture is that right because too much silence also will uh, make you become suspicious right so at times it's easier to blend by playing a gesture putting on some or giving off some joke around so you know they won't be uh, suspectful that is number four always say less than necessary rule number five so much depends on reputation guard it with your life right so reputation is the cornerstone of power. Through reputation alone, you can intimidate and win. Once it slips, however, you are vulnerable and will be attacked on all sides. Make your reputations unassailable. Always be alert to potential attacks and thwart them before they happen. Meanwhile, learn to destroy your enemy's reputation by opening holes in their own reputation. Then stand aside and let the public opinion hang them dry. Work to establish a reputation of outstanding quality, whether generosity or honesty or cunning. A good reputation can save you so much. A lot of work is done in advance by your reputation. Once established, always take the high road when attacked. So there's a always guard your reputation. Of course, it's a powerful person. Or you want to be powerful, and our road to become one of the people who holds power, we have to, um, I mean, guard a reputation. At the same time, which is in my case, I won't, I won't uh, advise it. Is that you should destroy your enemy's own reputation? by I mean, showing it to public, the opening opening a holes in their own reputation and then let the public destroy it. Things like that. According to the rule. I'm not saying that that's what you should do. 
personally, I'm not gonna do that. Um, the best, in my opinion, is just to guard your opinion, uh, guard your reputation, and always expect that somebody's gonna attack it. That's why it's very important that you have to guard it. Right? Anyway, we have the saying that says, "No one, if your reputation is your reputation is good." No, uh, we have the saying that will says, uh, "Nobody can put a good man down." Okay? So, being a good man, and having a good reputation, you can always be sure that you will not go down, and you won't need to destroy other people's reputation. But like what I said a while back, this one is like. Um, really practical in the sense that it is human nature to destroy other people right okay. the only thing again that i said is st that stopping us is our guiding principle what if you've met a person does not have their guiding principle right so that is um reading this book will already tell you that not all of us have those moral values moral guidelines that will um, stop us from doing something not good to other people next we have six rules number six court attention at all costs so everything is judged by its appearance like we always uh, say uh, first impression best right what is seen counts for nothing i mean what is unseen counts for nothing never let yourself get lost in the crowd then or be buried in oblivion stand out be conspicuous at all costs make yourself a magnet of attention by appearing larger more colorful more mysterious than the bland and timid masses <laughs> Again, court attention at all costs. Always find a way to draw the attention to yourself. It's a little bit narcissistic, thing. I mean, too narcissistic. Okay? Now, one example here is you have to surround your name with the sensational and scandalous. Draw attention to yourself by creating an unforgettable, even controversial image. For scandal, do anything to make yourself seem larger than life and shine more brightly than those around you. Make no distinction between kinds of attention. A variety of any sort will bring you power. Better to be slandered and attacked than ignored. So this is where what we call the 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 call or the statement that says there is no negative publicity or negative publicity is a positive publicity, right? So drawing it's better than being ignored, making yourself like um, center of attention, making yourself matter. Being the top of town will keep you relevant. At the beginning of your rise, spend all your energy on attracting attention. The quality of attention is irrelevant. Small attention, big attention, as long as you draw the attention of people, that is good. Create an air of mystery. Create an air of mystery. Okay. In a world growing increasingly banal and familiar, what seems enigmatic instantly draws attention. Never make it too clear what you are doing or about to do. Do not show all your cards. An air of mystery heightens your presence. It also creates anticipation. Everyone will be watching to see what happens next. The importance of creating 
an air of mystery. Remember, most people are up front and be read like an open book. Take a little care to control their words or image and are hopelessly predictable. Be simply holding back, keeping silent, occasionally uttering ambiguous phrases, deliberately appearing inconsistent, and acting odd in the sublest of the ways you will emanate an aura of mystery. Still, we are in rule number four, that is support, attention at all costs. And those are some, according to the book, ways on you how you can court attention to yourself. Okay. Rule number six. Rule number seven. Get others to do work for you, but always take credit. <laughs> hey, I have this story about us three teachers working. Uh, so um, the three of them were working, and then while uh, the principal is away, the uh, one of the guy let the two two of his friend work in uh, installing the ceiling ceilings for the classroom. So. They are working. The two of them are working while the other one is like uh, sitting, talking with them. But then he saw that their principal is coming to check on them. And the two were so busy, um, you know, um, installing the ceiling that they did not see that the principal is coming. So when that one guy asked them to just say, oh, take a rest for a while, uh, he asked them to take a break for a while. So they did, and then he took the hammer and he started nailing the plywood for the ceiling. And right about that time that he's doing that, the principal came and then he said, Oh, so you are doing all the work. You're a good, <laughs> you're a good carpenter, something like that. Uh, with a <laughs> and then he didn't even say anything just to, uh, he didn't even say that his two friends are the one who installed all the ceilings. <laughs> just accepted this per se appreciation so that's <laughs> that's one example of doing or letting others do the work and then <laughs> getting the credit right <laughs> so uh i just remember the story and i think that's a real story related to me by my by my good friends in uh, mankind um so use wisdom knowledge and legwork of other people to further your own cause not only will such assistance save your valuable time and energy it will give you a godlike aura of efficiency and speed in the end your helpers will be forgotten and you will be remembered never do yourself what others can do for you letting letting others do and then uh, you take the credit again it sounds negative right but again uh, if you have observed human behavior especially when everyone is trying to get on top you will see this happen you will notice that you will do it as you further your career and you will say oh that book is really talking about reality Okay. So you must secure the credit for yourself, learn to take advantage of others' work to further your own cause. Use the past, a vast storehouse of knowledge and wisdom. Learn this and you will look like a genius. And note, be sure to know when letting other people share the credits further your cause. Okay. So, um... Uh, aside from using others to work for you, you should also know when to share credit so that you can further your own career. That's rule number seven of power. And the next one, next rule is number eight. Make others or make other people come to you. Use bait if necessary. <laughs> Again, um, sometimes I'm smirking and smiling here because, you know, um, 
it's really difficult for me to share things that I don't agree with, but in some in some hindsight, I mean in some ways, agree with it. You know, I'm a little bit conflicted with these things, but if you're going to think about it deeply, there's some reality to it. That is why I'm sharing this to you. Okay, number eight, make other people come to you. Use bait if necessary. And when force well, when you force the other people to act, you're the one in control. It is always better to make your opponent come to you. Abandoning his own plans in the process. Lure him with fabulous gains, then attack. You hold the cards. The essence of power is keeping the initiative and forcing others to react. Keeping them on the defensive. Master your anger, yet play on people's natural tendency to react angrily when pushed and baited. So, this is on playing the emotions of people. It says there that you, as the person with power, you have to learn how to control your emotions. The guide there is the basic principle is never, never make the session when you are in the both end of the spectrum. By that I mean, do not make decision, do not utter words. When you are too happy and when you are angry, when you are in the both end of the spectrum of emotion, angry and happy, never ever make decision. I might want to add something to that. Never make decision when you're angry and when you're happy or when you're hop up or hyped up with coffee or caffeine. <laughs> the pain that's me. Alright, so that is um what is that? Make other people come to you and then controlling their I mean using their emotion so you can control them. Number nine, win through your actions never through an argument so it's better according to the book let's do summarize that it's better for you to win through actions showing the result through your actions than winning something through an argument because the thing is with argument it's a ferric victory it won't last right or it's a victory that has, I mean, that has a lot of consequences. You have destroyed a lot in the argument. Even if you won the argument, you have like destroyed a lot in your way of winning that thing. So it's better that you win through actions. In aiming for power, always look for the indirect route. Verbal argument has one use. It's for deception only. It's for covering your tracks. But it is not for winning. If you want to win something, never use an argument. Use argument only according to the book. When you want to mask or when you want to hide something. Or when, one thing, when you're caught in a lie. So you notice some people sometimes when they're caught lying instead of apologizing they will just create an argument right maybe they read the book that's why they do that <laughs> yeah now that you know that then of course now that you have heard about this rule number nine when then at least you know how to i mean um, you know how to negotiate you know how to go through it right when your boss or someone in power, someone who has the power above you does this, and you also at least have ways on how to defend right, yourself or how to go through it. Number 10. Again, we have like 48 laws. We already knocked down 10. There are 38 more to go. So, number 10. Infection. Avoid the unhappy and unlucky. 
Now, the, 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 the reason, the main reason here is that accordingly, this can infect you. You can die from someone else's misery. Emotional states are infectious as diseases. Um, yeah, I think I... <laughs> I would uh, say that this is true um, at times that's why I want uh, in my job in my workplace I want to be uh, being a group I mean I, I want staying with well, teachers I mean co-teachers co-workers who work hard because the the attitudes or personalities are infectious their work the work ethic if you saw or you see someone who has that very good work ethic, you want to be with that person. They can influence you in a way. Right? Not at once, not all at once, but as time goes by, you will be influenced by their good traits. And same is to be said with the negative traits. That's why it says there, avoid the unhappy and the unlucky. I don't know with unlucky because I think we create our own luck, but it tastes according to the book. <laughs> um, you may f you may feel you are helping the drowning man, but you are only precipitating your own disaster. The unfortunate sometimes draw misfortunes on themselves. They will also draw it on you. Associate with the happy and fortunes instead. The most important person to avoid is the sufferer of chronic dissatisfaction those people who are not satisfied examine someone's history to recognize these people turbulence a long line of broken relationships etc so you have to like do a background check on the people you're going with especially if you will be working with them every day like that right so you'll know what to avoid according to the book anyway uh, one way of taking this as a positive is that, like what I said a while ago, always associate. I mean, find uh, always associate yourself with those who have good working ethic, good moral values. I mean, uh, those can influence you. Um, sooner or later, if you reflect, you will see that you will see those people who have influenced you. Right? If you will associate yourself with like a happy-go-lucky person who always submits things late, sooner or later you'll find yourself doing the same. It's better that you associate yourself with people who work hard and then you follow, try to imitate, and then sooner or later you are influenced. Good way of improving ourselves. Next, number 11. Learn to keep people dependent on you. To maintain your independence, you must always be needed and wanted. The more you are relied on, the more freedom you have. Make people depend on you, on their happiness and prosperity, and you have nothing to fear. Never teach them enough so that they can do without you. Again. Okay. Um, maybe we can use this one in a good way but this is one of the ways okay? if you see people doing that okay, beware maybe they are trying to manipulate you uh, in the book of John Maxwell on the um, uh, seven uh, qualities of uh, qualities of a refutable leader one of the rules there is um, train people to be independent, which is in here it's saying the opposite, the entire opposite. It says here it's saying that we have to make people be dependent on us, right? We do not never teach them enough so they can do without you. The thing is, in my case, th this is uh, this is what I consider the famine mentality. Um, I believe that the more you share knowledge to other people, 
the more you can gain more, right? So you're giving at the same time you're also trying to get, right? So, um, but the the advantage of this one is, like I said, if we know this rule, we will notice people doing that. We can know people doing that, and at least if we view that as a negative thing, then we then then we can avoid that. So that's rule number 11. Keep people dependent on you. Number 12. Use selective honesty and generosity to disarm your victim. One sincere and honest move will cover over dozens of dishonest ones. Open heart gestures of honesty and generosity brings down the guard of even the most suspicious people. Once your selective honesty opens a hole in their armor, you can deceive and manipulate them at will. A timely gift, a Trojan horse, will serve the same purpose. Use selective honesty and generosity to disarm victim. Let's use an example close to home. Politicians, they're using what you call a selective honesty and generosity. They, like say, one honest and sincere move will cover dozens of dishonest ones. So, for three years that you have elected one leader, they will do things like, you know, let's just say, get people's money. <laughs> not to work as being promised but then when the campaign period is about to come they will all become sincere and honest and do good things just to cover the dozens of honest ones and that's why they're called politicians for a reason they have the power and they have learned how to manipulate people you know, so number 12 is being commonly used by people in power. Let's be wary of this. Use selective and honesty, a selective honesty and generosity to disarm your victim. Don't be a victim. Learn how to give and learn to give before you take an actual gift, generous act, kind of payment, an honest admission, whatever it takes. Selective honesty is best employed on your first encounter with someone. A, a history of deceit will cause any of act or generosity to be viewed with suspicion. Counter by embracing your reputation for dishonestly and often. Uh, dishonesty openly. See? So, a, pol a politician's move. Right? <laughs> So that is, <laughs> that is, you know, somewhat, somewhat, uh, what do you call this, negative in my view. But again, knowing this will help us improve. Next, number 13. When asking to help, Appeal to people's self-interest, never to their mercy or gratitude. When you ask people for help, appeal to their self-interest, never to their mercy or gratitude. If you need to turn to an ally for help, do not bother to remind him of your past assistance and good, good deeds. He will find a way to ignore you. Instead, uncover something in your request or in your alliance with him that will benefit him. So it's like, uh, if you help me, this will help you in a way. Something like that. Do not appeal for their mercy or gratitude. Do um, ask help in a way that those who are helping you will also be helped. It's like a win-win situation. It's a better way of putting it. He will respond enthusiastically 
when he sees something to be gained for himself. So that's one way of asking for help that at least 90% of the time will be responded with a positive response. Do not be subtle. You have valuable knowledge to share. You can make him rich. You can make him live longer and happier. Thanks to God. Train yourself to see inside others' needs and interests and desires. So, one of the attributes that we need to develop is to train ourselves to see what others' needs and then how can you use their needs so you can help yourself at the same time you can help them. Distinguish among powerful people and figure out what makes them tick. <laughs> All saints, you figure out what makes them tick. Powerful people, when they ooze greed, do not appeal to charity. When they want to look charitable and noble, do not appeal to their greed. So knowing them, knowing like knowing well what makes them tick, will always be able to help you uh, to get to their good side and get the help you need. That's rule number 13. When asking for help, appeal to people's self-interest, never to their mercy or gratitude. Because, like I said, human nature is we always see what will benefit you first before thinking about others. Number 14. Pose as a spy, I mean, pose as a friend, work as a spy. Knowing about your rival is critical. Use spy to gather valuable information that will help keep you up ahead. Better still, play the spy yourself. In polite social encounters, learn to prove. Ask indirect questions to get people reveal their weakness and intentions. There is no occasion that is not an opportunity for an artful spy. Having conversation with people. Spying. Pose as a friend, then work as a spy. During social gatherings and innocuous encounters, pay attention. This is when people's guard are down and they will reveal things. Give a false confession, and someone else will give the real one. You know, and, uh, are you now getting the reason why this one was banned in prison? <laughs> one of the reasons why, you know. Here. Contradict others to steer them to, emo to emotion and lose control of their words. One of the reasons why a rule I put to myself is that never ever say a word when you're angry or when you're too happy or when you need to not your real ones it's already here because some people will pose as a friend while they're working as a spy rule number 14 of 48 laws of power number 15 crush your enemy totally so I will read what's in the book and then I will share what I think we should do. Okay. So crush your enemy totally. All great leaders since Moses have known that a feared enemy must be crushed completely. Sometimes they will have they have learned this the hard way. If one ember is left alight, no matter how dimly it smolders, a fire will eventually break out. More is lost though, or through stopping halfway than through total annihilation. The enemy will recover and will seek revenge. Crush him, not only in body but in spirit. Recognize that you will accumulate enemies who cannot bring over you, who you cannot bring over to your side. And that to leave them in escape will mean you are never secure. Crush them completely completely. Or better yet not to make enemy right <laughs> there's the saying that says you cannot please anybody 
Okay. We cannot please anybody. If you have enemy, then use them. See. You uh, but I won't consider someone. Say for example, in a group, you won't consider someone who does not go with your vision an enemy. You will just say someone. This someone has other motive, right? Still working for you, and you can use them, right? Rule number two: use your enemy. This and again, this is one of the reason why we. Uh, the book reviewer said that the book is contradicting itself but anyway the reason why it says they're crush your enemy totally is that because the author um, recognized that you cannot please anyone and if you have you cannot please anyone those that you did not get to go to your side to join your side are your enemies and you have to crush them or they will be the one who will destroy you in the future. That's rule number 15. Number 16 is use absence to increase respect and honor. Too much circulation makes the price to go down. And more, the more you are seen and heard, the more common you appear. If you already established in a group, temporarily withdrawal from it will make you more talked about, even more admired. You must learn when to leave, create value through discourse. Uh, Kenny Richards uh, said it better than the book. You must know when to fold it, know when to, know when to walk away, know when to run. Um, use your absence to create, create or to increase respect and honor. The truth of this law can most easily be appreciated in matters of love and seduction. Always leave them asking for more. Something like that. Another example of this law exists in economics. Scarcity increases value. Note this law only applies to once a certain level of power has been attained, leave too early and do not increase respect. You are simply forgotten. Simply, absence is the only effective in love and seduction once you have surrounded the other with your image. In the beginning, make yourself not scarce but omnipresent. So this rule only applies if you have gained um, somewhat a an enough power, right? That you can do this, and they will need you. So that is rule number sixteen. Whoa. <laughs> number seventeen. Keep others in suspended terror. Cultivate an air of unpredictability. Humans are creatures of habit with an instable need to see familiarity in other people's action. Your predictability gives them sense of control. Turn the tables. Be deliberately unpredictable. Behavior that seems to have no consistency or purpose will keep them off balance and they will wear themselves out trying to explain your moves. Taken to an extreme, this strategy can intimidate and terrorize. Other people does that. Let's take that into context in the educational sector. The air of unpredictability to some people, some supervisors will go unannounced to people uh, to places to check the rank and files who are the teachers okay. and teachers are terrorized by that act yeah that is really effective so number 17 really works you want to keep your rank and file suspended in terror cultivate and air of unpredictability at the same time 
they can feel your power at the same time, they hate you. <laughs> yeah. But the thing there is, you have the power over them. Do not be like, oh, let's go to number 18. Do not build fortress to protect yourself. Isolation is dangerous. The world is dangerous and enemies are everywhere. Everyone has to protect themselves. A fortress sem seems to be the safest, but isolation exposes you to more dangers than it protects you from. It cuts you off from valuable information. It makes you conspicuous and an easy target. Better to circulate among people, find allies, mingle. You are shielded from your enemies by the crowd. So, this uh, isolating yourself is also dangerous when you have the power. So you have to learn how to mingle. Okay? Learn how to. Uh, at times, you know, going or mingling in the crowd is at the same time gathering information. So do not build fortress that will protect you at the same time isolate. Build a fortress that will make you get more information while it's protecting you. So, retreat to a fortress and lose your contact with your source of power and your knowledge of what is going on. If you need time to think, then choose isolation as a last resort and only in small doses. So, uh, as a person of power, isolating yourself means you know, uh, making yourself an open target as you're cutting off information. So if you need time to think, do isolation in small doses of according to rule number 18. Rule number 19. Know who you're dealing with. Do not offend the wrong person. There are many, many different kinds of people in the world and you can never assume that everyone will react to your strategies in the same way. Deceive or outmaneuver some people and they will spend the rest of their life seeking revenge. They are wolves in lambs clothing. Choose your victims and opponents carefully. Then never offend or deceive the wrong person. Or better yet, never deceive anyone. Okay? But well, if your human nature is in control and you did, then according to the advice of the book, never deceive or offend the wrong person. Be able to recognize the type of person you're dealing with is critical. Here are the five most dangerous persons. An arrogant and proud man, any perceived slight will invite vengeance. Flee these people. The hopelessly insecure man, similar to the proud man, but will take revenge in smaller bites over time. Do not stay around him if you have harmed or deceived him. So these are the type of people you have to avoid. The third one is the Mr. Suspicion. Sees the worst in others and imagines that everyone is after him. Easy to deceive, get him turned to others. The Mr. Suspicion, you can use it to turn to others. Number three, the serpent with long memory. If hurt, he will show no anger but will calculate and wait. Recognized by his calculation and cunning in other areas of life, he is usually cold and affectionate. Crush him completely or flee. That's a serpent with a long memory. The next person to avoid is the plain, unassuming, and often unintelligent man. This one will not take the bait because he does not recognize it. Do not waste your resources trying to deceive him. Have a steady ready for a mark, a joke, a story. If the action is literal, this is the type you are dealing with. So 
So the the way you're going to like find the plain and assuming and often an intelligent man is have a test ready for a mark, a joke, a story, and if the reaction is literal, and uh, he is the type of person, you know, the plain and assuming. Never rely on instincts when judging someone. Instead, gather concrete knowledge. Also, never trust appearances. At this time, I uh, may think this book came from 1998. 1998. So, it's almost certain that a lot of people have read this. People who are dreaming to achieve great power have already read this one. And maybe they're already using the rules on you. So it's very um, like determining the type of person. You need time, need more time, need more information before you judge them. Rule number twenty: Do not commit to anyone. It is the fool who always rushes to take sides. Do not commit to any side or cause but yourself. By maintaining your independence. You become the master of others, playing people against one another, making them pursue you. Again, is this somewhat uh, well? All of the rules in this book is somewhat controversial, right? Anyway, it's again I said a way of looking at this is when we learn these traits. You can either use it to improve yourself or use it not to so that you will not be victimized by other people so again do not commit to anyone do not commit to any side or cause but yourself your own cause do not commit to anyone but be courted by all you know let them ask you to go to their set. Stay aloof and gain the power that comes with attention and frustrated desire. Part two, do not commit to anyone. Stay above the fray. Do not let others drag you into their fights. Seem interested and support you. But be neutral. Stay neutral allows you to keep initiative and take advantage of the situation when one side starts to lose. <laughs> when you're neutral, you know, you can always choose the winning side. And in the Philippines, so we call that one balimbing, right? And again, people in power, say for example, politicians do that. And that's how they gain power, that's how they hold power. Because again, we said, human nature. It's like this. This is the reality. This is what's happening when we're trying to get into power. You only have so much time and energy. Every moment was wasted on affairs of others subtracts from your strength. Make sure to maintain emotional objectivity in the affairs of others. Okay, that is a good advice. Emotional objectivity and the affairs of others, even in your face, you have to, you know, weigh in. Check it. Number 21. Again, so that's number 20 is do not commit to anyone. Number 21. Play a sucker to catch a sucker. Name. Seem dumber than your mark. No one likes feeling stupider than the next person. The trick then is to make your victim feel smart and not just smart, but smarter than you are. Once convinced of this, they will never suspect that you have ulterior motives. Intelligence, taste, and sophistication are all things you should downplay or reassure others that they are more advanced than you. That's Rule number 21. Play a sucker to catch a sucker. Um, one of the best way on using this one is, you know, just saying you don't know so you can avoid being given a lot of tasks that 
you won't be having enough time for yourself. No. <laughs> Make people feel that they're smarter than you. It's the same way as rule number one. Make your master shine. Or do not outshine your master. Right? Next, we have number 22. Use the surrender tactic. Transform weakness into power. When you are weaker, never fight for honor's sake. Choose surrender instead. Surrender gives you time to recover. Time to torment and irritate your con conqueror. Time to wait for his power to wane. Do not give him the satisfaction of fighting and defeating you. Surrender first. By turning the other cheek, you infuriate and unsettle him. Make surrender full of power. The essence of the surrender tactic. Inwardly to stay firm, but out outwardly to bend. Your enemy will be bewildered then properly executed as they will be expecting retaliation. You know, so, um, even the greatest warrior, Chinggis Khan, had uh, surrendered in one of his battles. I mean, he ran away to leave and fight the uh, for other day. According to him, that's his word. So, so in the in the world of um, power play, that is also a tool. Surrender is a power tool. Not giving your enemy the satisfaction of beating you. Before you give that to them, you surrender. You will have time to regroup. You will have time to become stronger. Then you can take the fight back to them if you think you can beat them. Right? That's number 22. Surrender tactic. Number 23. Concentrate your forces. Conserve your forces and energies by keeping them concentrated at the strongest point. You gain more by finding a rich mine and mining it deeper than fleeting from one shallow mine to another. Intensify defeats, intensify or extensify every time. When you're looking for sources of power to elevate you, find 1k patron or patron the fat cow will give you milk for a long time to come. Concentrate forces. Concentrate on a single goal, single task, and beat it into submission. Note, when fighting a stronger enemy, you must be prepared to dissolve your forces and be elusive. That is con concentrating your forces, rule number 23. Number 24. Rule number 24. Play the perfect courtier. Courtier is someone who, who is in a royal court right? in the times of the kings and queens. So a perfect courtier thrives in the world where everything revolves around power and political dexterity. He has mastered the art of indirection. He flatters. He yields to superiors and asserts power over others in the most oblique and graceful manner. Because you're a courtier, you should assert power in an oblique and graceful manner. Learn and apply the laws of courtiership, and there will be no limit on how you can rise in the court. So what are the laws of politics? Let's take a look at it. This is rule number 24, part of rule number 24 on playing a perfect or perfect courtier. Study the laws of politics. Avoid ostentation. Modesty is always preferable. Practice nonchalance. That never appear to be working too hard. Your talent must appear to flow naturally with ease. Showing your blood and toil is a form of ostentation. Be frugal with flattery. 
flattery indirectly by or flatter indirectly by being modest arrange to be noticed Pay attention to your appearance and find a way to create the subtly distinctive style in the image alter your style and language according to the person you're dealing with acting the same with all will be seen as condescension by those below you and often those above you so create or alter your style and language according to the person you're dealing with never be the bearer of bad news the messenger is always killed so bring only glad news in the field of politics <laughs> so never be the bearer of good news i mean bad news next never affect friendliness and intimacy with your master he does not want a friend or a subordinate never befriend your boss oh. <laughs> never befriend or never affect a friendliness and intimacy with your master always remember they're always your boss never criticize those above you directly err on the side of subtlety and gentleness never criticize those above you directly be frugal in asking those above you for favors it is always better to earn your favors do not ask favors on other person's behalf never joke about appearance or taste do not be a court cynic express admiration for the good work of others be soft observant so observant must train yourself to evaluate your own action oh that can help us a lot right at the end of the day we have to reflect about what the things that we did okay and that is one of the positive things that we can glean from this book master your emotions exactly master your emotions okay. a person in power must be a person in control okay. we have to be in control of our the way we act at the same time we have to be in control of our emotions <laughs> fit the spirit of the time your spirit and way of thinking must keep up with the times even if the times offend your sensibilities get fit the spirits or the spirit of the times okay uh, one way of sh uh, rewarding is you must evolve go with the changes be ready to change be a source of pleasure if you cannot be the life of the party at least obscure your less desirable qualities obscure your less desirable qualities rule number 24 play the perfect courtier mastering the laws of court politics number 25 recreate yourself do not accept the rules that society foist on you recreate yourself by forging a new identity one that commands attention and never bores the audience be the master of your own image rather than letting others define it for you. Incorporate the dramatic devices into your public gestures and actions. And you will or your your power will be enhanced and your character will seems will seem to be larger than life. First step in the process of self-creation is being aware of yourself and taking control of your appearances and emotion. So recreating yourself a lot of people in in a uh, power have done that Margaret Thatcher an example okay, so recreating yourself will almost or will certainly make you gain more power the second step of self-creation recreation is the creation of a memorable character that compels attention and stands above others on the stage next rhythm timing tempo 
over time will also contribute greatly in the creation of a character. Appreciate the importance of stage entrance and exits. The world is like your stage and you have to appreciate the importance of entrance and exits. Okay. Or you can also mean that literally. Because in one of the rules, it says there that you have to draw attention to yourself. That's number 25. You have to learn how to recreate yourself. Though all of us in our daily lives are recreating ourselves, right? If you come to think of it, you are not the same person as you are 10 years ago or even 5 years ago. People are changing. And we, are, we have to change and we have to recreate ourselves for the better. Rule number 26, keep your hands clean. You must seem a paragon of civility and efficiency. Your hands are, your hands are never soiled by mistake and nasty deeds. Maintain such a spotless appearance by using others as scapegoats and cut paws to disguise your involvement. Conceal your mistake. Have a scapegoat to blame. Oh, a lot of people are doing that. A lot of people in power have mastered that. Okay. Now, a book in... Um, a book of... Uh, um, a retired Navy SEAL high-ranking official entitled the um, extreme ownership will contradict this principle but this is again the rule has observed that human nature first creates without thinking next make use of a cot's paw those around you use those around you to complete or to complete dirty tasks, to hide your intentions and accomplish your goals while keeping your hands clean. Use essential elements in this strategy is concealing your goal. Devices like this are best for approaching those in power or planting information. You may also offer yourself as a cat's paw to gain power. Note, you must be very careful in using tactic as being revealed would be disastrous. That's why be careful in using number 26. Number 27. People or play on people's need to believe to create a cult-like following. People have an overwhelming desire to believe in something, become the focal point of such desire by offering them cuts, a new fate to follow. Keep your words vague but full of promise. Emphasize enthusiasm over rationality and clear thinking. Give your new disciples ritual to perform. Ask them to make sacrifices on your behalf. In the absence of organized religion and grand causes, your new belief system will bring untold power. Again, this is a rule that's being done by cult leaders. You know? Here are five easy steps <laughs> in creating a cult. Keep it vague. Keep it simple. Use words to attract attention with great enthusiasm. Fancy titles for simple things are helpful, as are their use of numbers and the creation of new words for vague concepts. All of this create the impression of specialized knowledge. People want to hear there is a simple solution to their problems. Okay, so that's number one way. Keep it vague and keep it simple. Second step in creating cult. Connected to rule number 27. Playing on people's need to believe. 
emphasize the visual and the sensual over the intellectual. Boredom and skepticism are two dangers you must counter. The best way to do this is through theater, creating a spectacle, appeal to all the senses, use the exotic. The third one, borrow the form of organized religion to structure the group, create rituals, organize followers into hierarchy, rank them in grades of sanctity, give them names and titles, ask them for sacrifices that fill your coffers and increases your power. Talk and act like a prophet. Next, disguise your source of income. Make your wealth seem to come from the truth of your methods. And the next one is set up an us versus them dynamic. First, make them sure your followers believe that they are a part of an exclusive club unified by common goals then manufacture the notion of devious enemy out to ruin you people are not interested in the truth about change that it requires hard work but rather they are dying to believe something romantic otherworldly the most effective cult mix religion with science i, I, I think they're talking about scientology here <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's a way of creating a cult. Now that we know this, at least we have some sense, or we know how cult leaders attract followers. Right? And that is those are the things that they're doing. And according to the book, the most effective religion or cult is the one that makes this religion and science. Is that science? No, I don't think so. Next, we have number 28. Interactions or interaction with boldness. If you're unsure of the actions, do not attempt it. Your doubts and hesitation will infect your execution. It is true. Timidity is dangerous. Better to enter with boldness. Make mistake, you commit. Through any mistake you commit through audacity are easily corrected with more audacity. Everyone admires the bold, no one honors the timid. So, interaction with boldness. If you're doubting your action, or if you're, if you're having hesitations, postpone the execution. If you're having hesitations with your plan, better not go through it until you're confident enough. Some of the most pronounced psychological effects of boldness and timidity. So, if we are bold rather than timid, these are some of the effects. The bolder the lie, the better. The sheer audacity of bold lie makes the story more credible, distracting from its inconsistencies. When entering a negotiation, ask the moon or ask for the moon and you'll be surprised how often you get it. Boldness, the lie, the boldness, the lie, the better. These are the effects. Lions circle the hesitant prey. Everything depends on perception. And if on the first encounter you demonstrate a willingness to compromise, back down and retreat, you will be pushed around without mercy. In reality, okay. that's happening. Boldness strikes fear. Fear creates authority. The next rule is going halfway with a half a heart digs a deeper grave. Audacity separates you from the hurt. Hesitation creates gaps. Boldness obliterates them. Most of us are timid. We want to avoid tension and conflict and be liked by all. A lot of people are that. They don't like to offend a lot of people. You want to be liked by all. So that's stability. We are terrified of the consequences. What others think of us 
and those still be we will stir up. If we dare go beyond the usual place. But we must practice and develop boldness. The place to begin with is in negotiation. How often we ask too little. Remember, the problem created by a vicious move can be disguised, remedied, and um, fixed by more and greater audacity. That's rule number 28. Interaction with boldness. So that is rule number 28. Now let's go find, let's continue with the rules, but before that, we'll have this one first. The song you're listening to is from Margaret Lucano, an Ecuador singer. Okay, now, here we go. <clears throat> number 30. Before we go to rule number 30, we have to go to rule number 29. Right? Plan all the way to the end. The ending is everything. There's a book that says, begin with the end in mind. Right? So, a good advice. Plan all the way to the end. Everything and the ending is everything. Plan all the way to it. Taking into account all the possible consequences, obstacles, and twists of fortune that might reverse your hard work in give glory to others. By planning to the end, you will not be overwhelmed by circumstances and you will know when to stop. Gently guide fortune and help determine the future by thinking far ahead. The ending is everything. It is the end of action that determines who gets the glory, the money, the prize. Your conclusion must be crystal clear. You must keep it constantly in mind. The thing with the, when we say plan everything, plan everything to the end is that we will never lose our motivation. If we have or we bear the end in mind and we are so clear in our mind of the result that we want to achieve, we will never lose sight of what needs to be done. So rule number 29 actually is a sound advice. Plan all the way to the end. Rule number 31. Make your accomplishment seems effortless. If you, are, if you achieve something, you can just say, Oh, it's <laughs> Or One way of putting this one is, so once you achieve one accomplishment, Start working to achieve another. Right? Do not celebrate too long for an accomplishment. Take a minute to breathe, but then go start working on another one. Your action must seem natural and executed with ease. All the toil and practice that you got in your that go into them and all the clever tricks must be concealed. When you act, act effortless, as if you could do much more, right? Even if you worked hard for it, act effortless. Avoid the temptation of revealing how hard you work. It only raises question. Teach no one of your trick or they will be used against you. This is, I think, when a person has the famine mentality that is going to happen right? but um, generally we can say that most people have the famine mentality and that's what they're going to do they will not teach their tricks to other people because they're they fear that it will be used against them but in what we're calling the um, abundance mentality is that you're not worried if you're going to share your tricks because you already know the tricks you already used it up and it's time for you to leave that time for you to give it to other people and it's time for you to develop new tricks for yourself that's the abundance mentality 
Okay. Anyway, the books here he sees, uh, the books here says that make your accomplishments seem effortless. Some think exposure to how hard work and practice demonstrate diligence and honesty, but really it just shows your weakness. Is pet satura or the capacity to make the difficult seem easy? What is the understandable? It's not all inspiring. The more mystery surrounds your action, the more awesome your power seems. You appear to be the only one who can do that or who can do what you do. And because of your achievement and accomplishment with grace and ease, people believe that you can always do more. Rule number 30, make your accomplishment seems effortless. Rule number 31, control the options, get others or get others to play with the cards you deal. The best deceptions are the ones that seem to give the other person a choice. Remember this, the best deceptions are the ones that give or seem to give others a choice. Your victims feel that they are in control but you are or but are actually your puppets. Give people options that come out in your favor whichever one they choose. Force them to make choices between the lesser or or the lesser of two evils, both of which will serve your purpose. Put them on horns of dilemma. They are bored whichever they turn. Withdrawal and disappearances are classic ways of controlling the options. You give people a sense of how things will fall apart without you, and you offer them a choice. I stay away and you will suffer, or I will return under my conditions. Now control the options to get others play the card you deal with. You actually, or we actually find choices between small number of alternatives more desirable than complete freedom of options. Now, the following are among the most common form of controlling the options. So here are the ways of controlling the options of people. Now, mind you, this might be being applied to you. And one way of knowing it is knowing how they do it. Now let's take a look at it. So color the choices. Propose multiple solutions but present the preferred one in the best light compared to the others. Excellent device for the insecure master. So you can just say, oh, here are your choices. Like A, B, and C. But you know, if you are going to ask me, I will choose C because something like that. Follow your choices. Force the resistor. This is a good technique to use on children and other willful people who enjoy doing the opposite of what you ask them to. Push them to choose what you want them to do by appearing to advocate the opposite. Like reverse psychology. Alter the playing field. <coughs> alter the playing field so altering the playing field is say um no their hand is being forced but it doesn't matter the technique is effective against those who resist at all costs okay. i mean all costs there's something wrong with that might anyway shrinking the option another way of controlling options a variation of this technique is to raise the raise the price every time the buyer hesitates and the other day goes by this is an excellent negotiating ploy to use on the chronically indecisive who will fall for the idea that they are getting a better deal today than if they wait till tomorrow like uh some salesperson say 
Okay, uh, you you can get this one now for like 4,000 pesos, but if you are going to wait for it, and then it will go to the market, it will become 16,000 pesos. Now, if you notice that they do that, they are trying to shrink your options so that you will fall into a trap of buying things in what you think is a cheaper price but this is actually expensive okay. common forms of controlling options next the weak man on the precipice he would describe all sorts of dangers exaggerating them as much as possible until the duke saw a yawning abyss in every direction except one the one reds was pushing him to take this tactic is similar to the color choices but with the wick but with the wick you have to be more aggressive work on their emotions use fear and terror to propel them into action try and they will always find ways to procrastinate you know? so you're trying to control the options and then trying to let them think that they're the one who made the decision it's controlling people brothers in crime this is a classic con artist technique you attract your victims to some criminal scheme creating a bond of blood and guilt between you they participate in your deception commit the crime or they think they did and are easily manipulated it is often wise to implicate in your deceptions the very person who can do you the most harm if you fail their involvement can be subtle even a hint of their involvement will narrow their options and buy their silence brothers in crime points of dilemma this is a classic trial lawyer's technique the lawyer leads the witness to decide between two possible explanations of an event both of which poke a hole in the story they will have to answer the lawyer's question but whatever they say may hurt themselves the key to this move is to strike quickly deny the victim the time to think of an escape as they wriggle between horns of dilemma they dig or they dig their own grave controlling the option has one main purpose to disguise yourself as the agent of power and punishment again that's rule number 30 31 controlling the options okay. and some examples of how you can control the options that you give to people number 32 rule number 32 of the 48 laws of power by robert green play to the people's fantasies play to the people's fantasies let's go to more okay. here we go okay. uh oh see this ones are not good for us the songs are what we call um, songs that are copyrighted. Okay. <laughs> Let's go look at this song. Okay. So we are in rule number 32. Play to people's fantasies. The truth is often avoided because it is ugly and unpleasant. Never appeal to the truth and reality unless you are prepared for the anger that comes to those this enchantment. Life is so harsh and distressing that people who can manufacture romance and conjure up fantasy are like oasis on the desert. On the desert. Everyone flocks to them. There is a great power in tapping into the fantasy of the masses. Like Magiging. Tiger of Asia and Filipinas. It's the fantasy of all Filipino, right? And if you tap that one, you will easily win elections. 
Never promise a gradual improvement through hard work. Rather promise the moon, the great and sudden transformation, and the pot of gold play on people's fantasies. The key to fantasy is distance. The distance as allure and promise seems simple and problem-free. What you are offering then should be ungraspable. Never let it be or never let it become oppressively familiar. Right. Like, uh, in six months, crimes will be gone. Rule here is, somebody played with people's fantasy. And 48 Laws of Power. I think a lot of politicians have read this already. <laughs> Discover each month's time screw. Everyone has weakness. A gap in a castle wall. The weakness is usually an insecurity, an uncontrollable emotion or in need. It can also be a small secret pleasure. Either way, once found, it is a time screw you can turn to your advantage. How to find the weakness of person pay attention to gestures and unconscious signals every conversation is a great place to look start by always seeming interested offer a, re a revelation of your own if needed probe for suspected weakness in the record train your eyes for details Find a helpless child. Knowing about childhood can reveal weakness or when they revert to acting like a child. Look for contrast. An overt trait can conceal its opposite. The shy crave attention. The uptight want adventure. Usually, right? Find a weak link. Find a person who can or who will bend under pressure. Or the one who pulls strings behind the scene. Fill the void. The two main emotional voids of our insecurity and unhappiness. Feed an uncontrollable emotion. The uncontrollable emotion can be a paranoid fear for any base motive such as lust, greed, vanity, and hatred. So those are the uncontrollable emotions. And for a person, you have to learn how to control those. Always look for passions and obsessions that cannot be controlled. The stronger the passion, the more vulnerable the person. People's need for validation and recognition, their need to feel important is the best kind of weakness to exploit. To do so, all you need to do is find ways to make people feel better about their taste, their social standing, their intelligence. Timidity can be exploited by pushing them into bold actions that serves your need while also making them be dependent on you. Wow. <laughs> Number 34. B. Royal in your own fashion. Act like a king to be treated like one. The way you carry yourself will often determine how you are treated. In the long run, appear vulgar or common will make people disrespect you. For each, for a king, or for a king respects himself and inspires the same sentiment in others. By acting regularly and confident of your powers, you make yourself seem distinct to wear a crown. You know? So acting like a royal will demand acts of royalty to you right or will you will get the respect you deserve something like that so that's rule number 34 be a royal in fashions act like a king and be treated like one act uh, how you can carry yourself reflect what you think of yourself use the strategy of the crown if you believe you are destined for great things. Our belief will radiate outward. 
just as the crowd creates an aura around the king. The trick is simple. Be overcome by your self-belief. This may separate you from people, but that's the point. You must always act with dignity. True this should not be confused with arrogance. So you should act with dignity, but make sure that you are not being arrogant. Dignity is the mask you assume that makes it as if nothing can affect you and you have all the time in the world to respond. There are strategies that can help you. The Columbus strategy, always make a bold demand, set your price high and do not waver. The David and Goliath strategy, go after the highest person in the building. This immediately puts you on the same plane as the chief executive you are attacking. The patron strategy give a gift of some sort to those above you. That is, be a royal in fashion and act like a king and be treated like one. Rule number 35. Master the art of timing. Everything is in timing, right? <clears throat> Never seem to be in a hurry or hurrying betray a lack of control over yourself and over time. Always seem patient as if you know that everything will come to you eventually. Become a detective of the right moment. Sniff out the spirit of the time, the tense that will carry you to power. Learn to stand back when the time is not yet right. And strike fiercely when you have reached fruition. Three types on how to deal with them. Long time. Be patient, control your emotion, and take advantage of opportunities when they arise. You gain long-term perspective and see further in the future. The fourth time is the trick in forcing time is to upset the timing of others. To make them hurry, make them wait, make them abandon their own pace, use deadline, apply sudden pressure, change pace, uses and time patience is useless unless combined with willingness to act decisively decisively at the right moment use speed to paralyze your opponent cover any mistakes and impress people with your aura of authority and finality that is mastering the art of timing rule number 36 Disdain. Disdain things you cannot have. Ignore them. It's the best revenge. Okay. So, by acknowledging a petty problem, you give it existence and credibility. The more attention you pay an enemy, the stronger you make him. A small mistake is often made worse and more visible when you try to fix it. It is sometimes best to have things alone or to leave things alone if there is something you want but cannot have show contempt of it the less interest you reveal the more superior you seem that is rule number 36 disdain things you cannot have ignoring them is the best revenge next <clears throat> Number 37. Create compelling spectacles. Striking imagery and grand symbolic gestures create an aura of power. Everyone responds to them. Stage a spectacle for those around you. Then, full of arresting visuals and radiant symbols that heighten your presence. Dazzled by appearances, no one will notice what you are really doing. To create compelling spectacles. Number 38. Think as you like, but behave like others. If you make a show of going against the times, flaunting your unconventional ideas in unorthodox ways, people will think that you only want attention and that you look down upon them. They will find a way to punish you for making them feel inferior. It is safer to bend in and nurture 
the common touch. Share your originality with tolerant friends and those who are sure to appreciate your uniqueness. Plant your pleasures in alien ways of thinking and acting will reveal a different motive. Demonstrate your superiority over fellows. The only time it is worth standing out is when you already stand up. When you have achieved an unshakable position of power and can display your difference from others as a sign of distance between you. So think as you like, but behave like others. You have to learn how to blend in. That's what rule number 38 is asking. Rule number 39 is steers up water to catch fish. Anger and emotions are strategically counterproductive. You must always stay calm and objective. But if you can make your enemies angry while staying calm yourself, you gain a decided advantage. Put your enemies off balance. Find chink in their vanity through which you can rattle them and hold the strings. This is the essence of the law. When waters are still, your opponents have the time and space to plot action and still will initiate control. Steer the water, force the fish to surface, get them to act before they are ready. Steal the initiative. The best way to do this is to play on uncontrollable emotions, pride, vanity, love, and hate. Just playing with their emotion is sharing the water. Angry people end up looking ridiculous. This comical how much they take personally and more comical how they believe or how they believe that outbursts signify power. That is rule number 39. Number 40. Rule number 40 of the 48. Laws of powers. Despise free lunch. What is offered for free is dangerous. It usually involves either a trick or a hidden obligation. What has worth has what has worth is worth paying for. By paying your own way, stay clear of gratitude, guilt, and deceit. It is also often wise to pay the full price. There's no cutting corners with excellence. Or with excellence. Be lavish with your money and keep it circulating, for generosity is a sign and magnet of power. What is offered free often has a psychological price tag. Yeah, all of us know that, right? Complicated feelings of obligation compromises with quality, the insecurity those compromises bring, and on and on. By paying the full price, you keep your independence and room to maneuver. Being open and flexible with money also teaches the value of strategic or strategic generosity. So avoid people who fail to use money creatively and strategically or turn their inflexibility to your advantage. So we have that as a rule, despise free lunch. Number 41. Avoid stepping into a great man's shoe. What happens first appears better and more original than what comes after. If you succeed a great man or have famous parents, you will have to accomplish double their achievement to outshine them. Do not get lost in their shadow or stuck in the past not of your own making. Establish your own name and identity by changing course, slay the overbearing father, disparage their legacy, and gain power by shining your own way. If you cannot start materially from ground zero, it would be foolish to renounce an inheritance. You can at least begin from ground zero psychologically. Never let yourself be seen as following your predecessor's path. You must physically demonstrate your difference by establishing a style and symbolism that you set the point. So avoid 
stepping into a great man's shoe. Create your own identity. Number 42. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Trouble can often be traced to a single strong individual, the steward, the arrogant underling, the prisoner of goodwill. If you allow such person or people room to operate, others will succumb to their influence. Do not wait for troubles they cause you to multiply. Do not try to negotiate to them. They are irredeemable. Neutralize their influence by isolating or banishing them. Strike the source of the trouble and the sheep will scatter. Again, this is written as an observation of the natural behavior of human. And the way to stop it is doing that. Number 43 work on the heart and minds of others. Coercion creates a reaction that will eventually work against you. You must seduce others by wanting to move into wanting to move in your direction. A people you have seduced becomes your loyal pawn and the way to seduce others is to operate in their individual psychologies and weaknesses. Soften up the resistance by working in their emotions, playing on what they hold dear and what they fear. Ignore the hearts and minds of others and they will grow to hate you. Remember, the key to persuasion is softening people up and breaking them down gently. Seduce them with two-pronged approach, work on their emotions and play on their intellectual weakness. Be alert to both what separates them from everyone else, their individual psychology, and what they share with everyone, their basic emotional response. Aim at the primary emotions, love, hate, and jealousy. Once you move their emotion, you have reduced their control, making them more vulnerable to persuasions. That's number 40. Work on the hearts and minds of others. Number 44. Disarm and infuriate with the minor effect. I mean minor mirror effect. Disarm and infuriate with the mirror effect. The mirror reflects reality, but it also reflects or also a perfect tool for deception. When you mirror your enemies doing exactly what they do, they cannot figure your strategy. The mirror effect mocks and humiliates them, making them overreact. By holding up a mirror to their psyches, you seduce them with the illusion that you share their values. By holding up a mirror to their action, you teach them a lesson. Few can exist or few can resist the power of the mirror effect. <laughs> so mirror effect can disturb or entrance others, giving you power to manipulate or seduce them. Okay, now what are mirror effects examples? There are four mirror effects, or there are four main mirror effects, and these are one. Neutralizing effect. Do what your enemies do, following their actions as best as you can, and they are blinded. The first version is the shadow. Shadow your opponents every move without them seeing you. Narcissus effect. Look into the desire, values, taste, spirit of others and reflect, reflect it back to them. The moral effect. Teach others by giving them a taste of their own medicine. They must realize you are doing to them the same thing they did to you. Hallucinatory effect or hallucinatory effect. Create a perfect copy of an object, place a person that the people take care or take for the real thing because it has the physical appearance of the real thing. Those are the four main mirror effects. Rule number 45. Pitch the need for change but never reform too much at once. Everyone understands the need for change is in an abstract but 
on the day-to-day -day level, people are creatures of habit. Try or too much innovation is traumatic and will not or will lead to revolt. If you are new to a position of power or an outsider trying to build a power base, make a show of respecting the old way of doing things. If change is necessary, make it feel like a gentle improvement of the past. Borrow the weight and legitimacy from the past, however remote, to create a comforting and familiar presence. If you want to change, do it incrementally, not at once. Humans desire change in an abstract and superficial change, but a change that upsets core habits and routines is deeply disturbing to them. Understand, the fact that past is dead and buried gives you freedom to reinterpret. To support your cause, tinker with the facts. The past is a text in which you can safely insert your own lives. A simple gesture like using an old title or keeping the same number of group will tie you to the past and support you with authority of history. Never appear too perfect. Number rule number 46. Never appear too perfect. Appearing better than others is always dangerous, but most dangerous of all is to appear to have no faults or weaknesses. Envy creates silent enemies. It is smart to occasionally display defects and admit to harmless vices in order to deflect envy and appear more human and approachable. Only gods and dead can seem to be perfect with impunity. Though so never appear to be perfect. That's rule number 46. Rule number 47. Do not go past the mark you aim for. In victory, learn when to stop. The moment of victory is often the moment of greatest peril. In the heat of victory, arrogance and overconfidence can push you past the goal you have aimed for. And by going too far, you make more enemies than you defeat. Do not allow success to go to your head. There is no substitute for strategy and careful planning. Set a goal, and when you reach it, stop. Rule number seven sounds practical, right? Learn when to stop. And number 48, assume formlessness. And this one is very common to all the fighters who love Bruce Lee. Assume formlessness is said in a way, in, in, in a different way, where Bruce Lee said, be a water. Water can become the tipa. Water can become the shape of the container it's being poured into. Right? So that is formlessness. By taking a shape, by having a visible plan, be open, you open yourself to attack. Instead of taking a form of your enemy to grasp, keep yourself adaptable on the move. Accept the fact that nothing is certain and no law is fixed. The best way to protect yourself is to be fluid and formless as water. Never bet on stability or lasting order. Everything changes. That's that's the reason why you have to be formless. Or you have to assume formlessness. Because everything is changing. Right? So like I said before, rules or your beliefs must adapt to the changes that time brings. And these are what is considered to be the rules or the 48 laws of power by Robert Reed. Now there are some of the principles here that I do not agree with, but anyway, it's nice to know how it's like uh, these are books of, that 
that tells us the behave behavior of people who are in power or who are trying to go or to get into power. Right? And it's very beautiful to read and analyze it so that we won't be dragged into a trap that someone created, someone trying to further their create a career created, or at least we can identify those red flags and avoid them. Some of the rules or the laws are uh, good sounding, by that I mean we can use it and you can always take that and use it in our lives. Anyway, that is The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, a book that was banned in some prisons in America and a book that seems to be a book on how to manipulate others but as a good person good person that you are for those who are listening a book that we can use to improve ourselves anyway this is El Maestro Speaks Podcast and this is El Maestro saying see you again next time